Hi everyone, my name is Kelsey Betzelberger. Welcome. Hi everyone, so excited to welcome you to our tour today. For those of you who don't know me very well, my name is Kelsey and I am originally from Chicago. And my husband and I moved to Valencia, Spain last February. We're loving it, it's beautiful. And I have been taking quite a few trips lately. So this is one of the beautiful places that I am so excited to bring you to. So let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to Cuenca, everyone. This is a beautiful city, part of Spain. It is part of the autonomous community of Castilla-La Mancha the capital of the province of Cuenca. It has roughly 55,000 people in it, and it is about two to three hours on a train from Valencia, which is where I live. So here is the train station, Fernando Sobel, and I am so excited to bring you to this beautiful town today. So let me tell you about this lovely place in Spain. With its rich history and enduring importance, Cuenca stands as a testament to the cultural and architectural legacy of Spain. It was founded by the Moors during the Islamic rule of the Iberian Peninsula, and the city's origins date back to the 8th century. It was during the Christian Reconquista, though, that Cuenca gained its prominence. It is in a strategic location, perched atop hills and surrounded by natural defenses, so it was a crucial stronghold of this time. Throughout the medieval period, Cuenca flourished as a thriving city, and it attracted artisans, craftsmen, and scholars. So its unique blend of Gothic, Renaissance, and Baroque architecture is a testament to this historical richness. Today, Cuenca's historic center is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, cherished for its architectural wonders and cultural significance, and the city's Museum of Spanish Abstract Art, as well as the hanging houses, the Casas Golgadas, and Cuenca's Cathedral are all the enduring testament to the artistic contributions of Cuenca. A little bit of background as we explore here. So when the Iberian Peninsula was a part of the Roman Empire, there, was, there were several important settlements in this province. And the place where Cuenca is located was uninhabited. So naturally, this was a great place for people to explore. So when the Moors captured this area in the year 714, they soon realized the value of the strategic location and they built a, a fortress between two gorges dug between the Jucar and the Huecar rivers, surrounded by a one kilometer long wall that we're actually seeing right now. Cuenca's economy soon became dominated by agriculture and textile manufacturing, enjoying growing prosperity. In the early 11th century, the Caliphate of Córdoba broke into several different states called taifas, and Cuenca was ruled by the Taifa of Toledo, possibly the, the biggest one, whose jurisdiction roughly spanned across the bulk of the entire area of Al-Andalus, today known as Andalusia. In the year 1076, Cuenca was besieged by Sancho Ramirez of Aragon, who failed to conquer this area, but his insistence led to numerous battles and skirmishes in this area. Finally, in October of 1177, the Arab domination had finally ended, and Cuenca was given a new set of laws, the Fuero, which happened to be written in Latin, and this ruled Cuenca's citizens. It was considered to be one of the most perfectly written at the time. During the next few centuries, Cuenca did enjoy some prosperity thanks to the textile manufacturing and livestock exploitation. The cathedral also started to be built at this time in this Anglo-Norman style with many French workers. Um, the king at the time, Alfonso VIII, his wife, Eleanor, had French cultural affinity and she wanted some French flair in this cathedral. 
So speaking of the Cuenca Cathedral, we happen to be in the Plaza Mayor, the main square, right in front of it. So let me give you some details as we explore this beautiful highlight of Cuenca. The Cuenca Cathedral is a Gothic cathedral located in the main square of Cuenca. The building is one of the earliest Spanish examples of Gothic architecture built at a time when the Romanesque style predominated in the Iberian Peninsula. In particular, the cathedral is characteristic of the Norman and Anglo-Norman architecture of the 12th century, which the Notre Dame de Paris is also an example. Work began in 1196, and it was largely completed in roughly 1257. For example, in the 16th century, the exterior, including the facade, was almost entirely renovated. In the 17th century, the Tabernacle Chapel was built, and the facade and the towers were formed. The, fa the facade was partially reconstructed in the Neo-Gothic style at the beginning of the 20th century in order to repair damage caused when the Bell Tower collapsed in 1902, but the cathedral is the seat of the Roman Catholic Diocese of Cuenca. So it still has a lot of funding and a lot of restoration efforts go into it on nearly a yearly basis. The Romanesque features of the cathedral date from its origins in the late Romanesque period. Characteristic of the Romanesque style, there were initially five staggered apses, a single transept and three naves in the main body of the building that we're seeing here. 13th century developments included the molded windows, statues of angels, and Anglo-Norman architecture influence can be seen here in the cathedral's vaulting. The temple is of great dimensions also. It has a length of 120 meters and is 36 meters tall, and it occupies an area of more than 10,000 square meters. The iconography of the Cuenca Cathedral is largely fantastical, with mythological and human figures interspersed amongst plant leaves, stems, fruits, meandering streams. Cuenca's cathedral is distinguished from many other cathedrals at this time by sculptures representing animals known to the West, such as the armadillo, pufferfish, or turtle, in its Gothic arches dating from the 15th century a period in the history of its construction that coincided with the European colonization of the Americas after 1492. It has been claimed that there are hidden messages in the iconography of the cathedral and within the city of Cuenca itself, including a coat of arms featuring a cup with an eight-pointed star, symbol of the Knights Templar, and that the Holy Grail was saved and preserved in this very cathedral. According to the Bible, as a consequence, the cathedral itself and all those who take refuge within it would be spared in the final revelation. Although no hard evidence has been discovered, it is interesting to think that perhaps there is more here than meets the eye. A little bit more info for you, though. This cathedral is celebrated for its stunning Gothic architecture. The facade has intricate stone carvings and sculptures showcasing religious and historical scenes, but this interior boasts soaring Gothic arches, ribbed vaults, ornate chapels. You can see the choir here. The construction of the cathedral began in the late 12th century during the reign of Alfonso VIII, the King of Castile. It replaced an earlier church and was built in the Gothic style that was flourishing across Europe at this time. And the cathedral exhibits a blend of architectural styles with the primary focus on this Gothic style. However, as the centuries passed, some Renaissance elements were incorporated into its design, particularly in the main chapel. Now the cathedral is home to numerous chapels featuring remarkable art and religious artifacts and the Capilla de Salvador, this main chapel we were discussing, boasts a beautiful altarpiece. 
This lovely pipe organ that dates back centuries is also a highlight of the Cuenca Cathedral. This cathedral played a significant role within the city's religious and cultural life over the centuries. It has witnessed significant events and has been a place of worship, reflection, and artistic expression. Throughout the year, the cathedral hosts various religious ceremonies and cultural events. It is a focal point for religious celebrations in Cuenca, including Semana Santa, or Holy Week processions. Along with the historic city center of Cuenca, this cathedral is designated a UNESCO World Heritage Site, recognizing its role in Spain's cultural heritage. It is a cultural gem, and it's a remarkable architectural feat, and it does invite visitors like us to explore its intricate design, the historical importance, and of course the artistic treasures within, including this stunning rose window. Now, let me give you some info about this rose window as well as stained glass as a whole. Because we are seeing so many beautiful things here, let me give you some history and some facts about stained glass windows. Stained glass windows have a rich history. They date back over a thousand years. The use of colored glass in windows has been traced back to ancient civilizations, including the Romans and Egyptians. However, the art of stained glass as we know it today began to flourish during the medieval period in Europe. Stained glass windows became particularly popular in the Gothic cathedrals of Europe during the 12th and 13th centuries. They were often used to depict biblical stories, religious themes, and the primary purpose was to teach religious lessons to a largely illiterate population. During this time in history, very few people could read. So one of the ways to explain the stories and the history of the Bible or the religious texts, where depending on where you were, was to literally write the story on the wall. Skilled craftsmen known as glazers created stained glass windows using te techniques such as leading and painting. Pieces of colored glass were assembled and held together by strips of lead, forming intricate designs. Painted details were added after that to enhance the visual storytelling. Stained glass windows were not only decorative, but also served as a form of religious instruction. The use of the vibrant colors and symbolism again helped to convey biblical narratives and the lives of saints to the congregation. So I have some fun facts for you about uh, stained glass windows. The oldest surviving stained glass window in Europe is found in the Augsburg Cathedral in Germany, and it dates back to the 11th century. The rose window is a, is a famous type of stained glass window, and it's often found in Gothic cathedrals. It features this circular design with intricate patterns radiating from a central point that, of course, resembles a blooming rose. The most famous rose window is at the Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. Tiffany glass is also something to be of note. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the artist Louis Confort Tiffany created Tiffany glass, known for its innovative use of opalescent glass and vibrant colors. His work is highly regarded and can be found in various churches and buildings throughout the world. Stained glass in secular settings is also something that can be found. While stained glass is most commonly associated with religious buildings, it has also been used in secular buildings, such as town halls. Wealthy people in the Middle Ages also used stained glass in their homes as a symbol of status and their wealth. Many stained glass windows have been damaged over the centuries due to wars, natural disasters, and neglect. So extensive restoration efforts have been made to preserve these works of art for the future generations. Stained glass continues to be a vibrant art form today. Contemporary artists and studios create stained glass pieces for a wide range of settings. So homes, museums, religious places, and public spaces. Stained glass windows remain a captivating and enduring form of art as well as storytelling blending history, religion, and craftsmanship into vibrant works of visual art. 
that continue to be cherished elements of architectural and cultural heritage around the world. Aren't they beautiful? While we explore, let's talk about some fun facts about Spain. We'll explore these on a more in-depth basis soon. The siesta culture. Spain is known for its siesta tradition, where many businesses and shops close in the afternoon for a few hours to allow people to rest and escape the heat of the day. And in Spain, there is a lot of heat. <laughs> the flamenco dance. Flamenco is a traditional type of Spanish music and dance style that originates from the Andalusian region. It's famous for its passionate, raw, and expressive performances. La Tomatina! Some of you might have gone to the Tomatina festival with me, but let me tell you a little bit more about it. Spain hosts the world's largest food fight, as they say, called La Tomatina. And as you can guess, participants are throwing tomatoes, hence the name, at each other in the small town off Valencia called Buñol. Bullfighting. Although controversial, bullfighting is a traditional Spanish spectacle, with the most famous events being held during the running of the bulls in Pamplona. Multiple languages. Spain has several official languages, including Spanish or Castilian, Catalan, Galician, and Basque. Catalan is spoken in Catalonia, while Basque is unique to the Basque country. Paella. Paella is a popular Spanish dish originating from the Valencian region. It typically includes rice, saffron, and a variety of ingredients. There's seafood, but there's also chicken and snails, or simply vegetables. A diverse geography. Spain has a diverse landscape, from beautiful beaches along the coastlines to the mountainous regions of the Pyrenees and the Sierra Nevada. It also has semi-arid deserts, like the Tabernas Desert. Famous artists. Spain has produced many renowned artists, including Pablo Picasso, Salvador Dali, who made significant contributions to the world of art. La Sagrada Familia. As many of you know who came with me on our La Sagrada Familia tour, this famous basilica in Barcelona, designed by architect Antoni Gaudi, has been under construction since 1882, and it's still not even finished. It is an architectural masterpiece. The link to this tour can be found in the information below this video in case you'd like more information on this amazing cathedral. Tapas. Tapas are a beloved Spanish culinary tradition where small flavorful dishes are served alongside drinks. And in Spain, there are many drinks. It's a great way to sample various Spanish foods. These are just a few of the fascinating facts and history about Spain. A country rich in culture, history, and tradition. Now, let me give you a little bit of background and history about the Moorish conquest here. Also known as the Islamic conquest of the Iberian Peninsula, the Moorish conquest was a significant historical event that spanned several centuries. It began in the 8th century when Muslim forces led by Umayyad Caliphate crossed the Strait of Gibraltar from North Africa and invaded the Iberian Peninsula. The conquest marked the beginning of the Islamic rule in parts of modern-day Spain and Portugal. The Moors, who were of Berber and Arab descent, introduced a rich culture and intellectual heritage to the region. The Moorish conquest had profound and lasting effects on the Iberian Peninsula. It resulted in a period of culture and intellectual flourishing known as Al-Andalus, which is where we get the name Andalusia, by the way, where Muslims, the Jewish population, and Christians coexisted and contributed to a vibrant, peaceful society. This era saw advancements in science, medicine, philosophy, and architecture, 
with notable figures like Averroes and Maimonides emerging as influential scholars. The architectural legacy of the Moors is still visible today in landmarks such as the Alhambra of Granada and the Mesquita in Córdoba. The Moorish conquest gradually expanded across the Iberian Peninsula, with the Umayyad Caliphate establishing the Emirate of Al-Andalus in the 8th century. Over time, Al-Andalus fragmented into various smaller Muslim-ruled territories, known as Taifas, due to internal conflicts. This fragmentation eventually allowed Christian kingdoms in the north to launch the Reconquista, a centuries-long effort to retake the Iberian Peninsula. Now, I found some interesting facts for us about this time. During the height of Al-Andalus, this region was known for its religious tolerance and coexistence. Muslims, the Jewish population, and Christians often lived side by side, and scholars from various backgrounds collaborated on intellectual pursuits. This period is often cited as an example of interfaith coexistence in history. The Moors also left an indelible mark on Iberian architecture. We can see this all over Spain, but especially in the south, places like Alhambra, a great palace and fortress complex in Granada, is celebrated for its stunning Islamic design and intricate tile work. The Mesquita in Córdoba also is a former mosque with a unique blend of Islamic and Christian architecture. The Al-Andalus was a center of scientific innovation during the Middle Ages also. Scholars in the region made significant contributions to fields such as astronomy, mathematics, and medicine. Their works were later translated into Latin and influenced European Renaissance thinkers. The Christian Reconquista gradually reclaimed territory from the Moors, leading to the eventual fall of the Nazareth dynasty in Granada in 1492. This marked the end of Muslim rule in Spain with the surrender of Boabdil, the last Nazareth ruler. The legacy of the Moorish conquest lives on in modern Spain, though, particularly in its culture, cuisine, and architecture. Moorish influences can be seen in traditional Spanish dishes, such as paella, and in the intricate tile work and arches of many historic buildings. The Moorish conquest of the Iberian Peninsula was a complex and transformative period in history, characterized by cultural exchange, intellectual growth, and architectural splendor. The legacy of Al-Andalus continues to shape Spain's cultural identity and heritage to this day. Some details for you on the Moorish influence on architecture. It is characterized by its distinctive features and intricate details. So first, the Moorish architecture is renowned for its intricate geometric patterns. We see this all over Spain. These patterns often feature interlocking designs, including stars, hexagons. These motifs can be found on tiles, plasterwork, and even in the layout of gardens and courtyards. The arches are particularly beautiful. Moorish arches are a prominent feature in their architectural designs. This horseshoe arch, known as the, quote, Moorish arch, is a classic example. These arches have a distinct shape resembling an inverted horseshoe, and they can be seen in doorways and windows, interior spaces, all over. Moorish architecture often incorporated the courtyards and the gardens as part of the integral elements of the design of the space also. These areas are typically adorned with fountains reflecting pools and lush vegetation. The Alhambra in Granada, for example, is a famous area that exemplifies this concept with stunning general life gardens that should not be missed. The stucco and plaster work are also very interesting. Elaborate stucco and plaster work are hallmarks of Moorish architecture. The intricate lace-like patterns are meticulously carved into plaster surfaces, creating a stunning visual effect. These can be observed on walls, ceilings, and even on domes. In terms of the mosaic tile work, Moorish buildings often feature these zelige, 
in Morocco, which are mosaic tile work patterns. These colorful tiles are arranged in geometric and floral patterns, creating breathtaking displays on walls, floors, fountains, uh, windows, door frames, very, very beautiful and much more popular than one might think all over Spain. Arabic calligraphy is another significant element in Moorish architecture. Inscriptions from the Quran or poetic verses are often incorporated into architectural designs, lending spiritual and artistic value to the structures. The influence of Moorish design elements continues to captivate architects and designers worldwide, contributing to the rich tapestry of architectural history. While we explore, let's talk about some fun facts about Spain. We'll explore these on a more in-depth basis soon. The siesta culture. Spain is known for its siesta tradition, where many businesses and shops close in the afternoon for a few hours to allow people to rest and escape the heat of the day. And in Spain, there is a lot of heat. <laughs> the flamenco dance. Flamenco is a traditional type of Spanish music and dance style that originates from the Andalusian region. It's famous for its passionate, raw, and expressive performances. La Tomatina! Some of you might have gone to the Tomatina festival with me, but let me tell you a little bit more about it. Spain hosts the world's largest food fight, as they say, called La Tomatina. And as you can guess, participants are throwing tomatoes, hence the name, at each other in the small town off Valencia called Buñol. Bullfighting. Although controversial, bullfighting is a traditional Spanish spectacle, with the most famous events being held during the running of the bulls in Pamplona. Multiple languages. Spain has several official languages, including Spanish or Castilian, Catalan, Galician, and Basque. Catalan is spoken in Catalonia, while Basque is unique to the Basque country. Paella. Paella is a popular Spanish dish originating from the Valencian region. It typically includes rice, saffron, and a variety of ingredients. There's seafood, but there's also chicken and snails, or simply vegetables. A diverse geography. Spain has a diverse landscape, from beautiful beaches along the coastlines to the mountainous regions of the Pyrenees and the Sierra Nevada. It also has semi-arid deserts, like the Tabernas Desert. Famous artists. Spain has produced many renowned artists, including Pablo Picasso, Salvador Dali, who made significant contributions to the world of art. La Sagrada Familia. As many of you know who came with me on our La Sagrada Familia tour, this famous basilica in Barcelona, designed by architect Antoni Gaudi, has been under construction since 1882, and it's still not even finished. It is an architectural masterpiece. The link to this tour can be found in the information below this video in case you'd like more information on this amazing cathedral. Tapas. Tapas are a beloved Spanish culinary tradition where small flavorful dishes are served alongside drinks. And in Spain, there are many drinks. It's a great way to sample various Spanish foods. These are just a few of the fascinating facts and history about Spain. A country rich in culture, history, and tradition. This gate is part of the city hall of Cuenca, known as the Ayuntamiento de Cuenca in Spanish, and it is a prominent civic building located in the historic city center. The city hall of Cuenca is, is an architectural gem, and it reflects the city's historical and artistic heritage. 
It features a mix of architectural styles, as you can see, Gothic and Renaissance elements. And this facade is adorned with ornate decorations and sculptures, and it showcases the historical and cultural significance here. It is not only a municipal administrative center, but also a historic monument. It dates back centuries, and it has been witness to many important events in Cuenca's history. The city hall is strategically located in the Plaza Mayor, the main square of, of Cuenca's city center. And this central location makes it a focal point for locals, but of course for tourists also, who are exploring the city. As we walk, let's talk a little bit about the Spanish lifestyle. The lifestyle in Spain is deeply influenced by the country's rich history, which spans millennia. Spain's history includes Roman, Moorish, Christian, and other cultural influences, resulting in a diverse and unique way of life. For centuries, Spain was a global colonial power, shaping its culture and traditions, and today it remains a vibrant and dynamic nation with a lifestyle that reflects its complex past. The Spanish lifestyle gives great importance to family, community, and leisure. Sounds good, doesn't it? <laughs> the concept of familia, as they say here, is central, with extended families often living close together and frequently gathering for meals and celebrations. I have a friend who is over 30 and still lives with his parents. He says he will move out when he meets the person he wants to marry. It is common here for young people to live with their parents until they move in with their future spouse. Spanish communities, from small villages to large cities, often have a strong sense of local identity, and festivals and traditions play a vital role in bringing people together. Spain boasts the Mediterranean lifestyle, so this is known for its emphasis on leisure, so siesta culture, a strong work-life balance, a really nice quality of life, Spain's climate and geography contribute to this lifestyle, though, with many Spaniards enjoying outdoor activities like hiking, swimming, and outdoor dining. Most people here eat their meals outside on a daily basis. Statistics indicate that Spain has one of the highest life expectancies in the world, partly attributed to its Mediterranean diet and relaxed pace of life. Stress is a huge indicator, and here, there's not a lot of it. The siesta tradition. As we spoke about, the siesta, which is the short afternoon nap, is a famous part of Spanish life. Many businesses close for a few hours in the afternoon to allow people to escape the heat and recharge, emphasizing this value of rest and relaxation. Spain is also renowned for its culinary culture, which goes beyond paella and tapas, although they are delicious. Each region has its own specialty dishes, such as Catalonia's seafood paella, Basque country's pinchos, and Andalusia's gazpacho, the cold tomato soup. Spain is also known for its vibrant festivals and traditions, including La Tomatina, the world's largest tomato fight, Semana Santa, which is the Holy Week processions, and the running of the bulls in Pamplona. These various festivals are just part of Spain's vibrant but relaxed way of life. Late dining is also something of note. It's common for Spaniards to have dinner late into the evening, often well past 9 or 10 p.m. This allows for extended socializing and a leisurely approach to meals. Spain's favorable climate also encourages this outdoor lifestyle. Like we talked about, sidewalk cafes, park, and plazas are bustling with activity year-round, making it easy to enjoy the fresh air and sunshine while you have tapas or your evening meal with your family. Spaniards also have a strong sense of regional identity. This can be seen in their regional languages, the traditions, and the cuisines. Catalonia, the Basque Country, Galicia, and other regions have distinct cultures within Spain. Not to mention the language. The Spanish language is not just a means of communication. It's an integral part of the Spanish lifestyle. The importance of family and community is often reflected in the language's use of familiar and formal forms of address. The Spanish lifestyle is a harmonious blend of tradition and modernity with a strong focus on family, community, and enjoying life's pleasures. 
its rich cultural tapestry, diverse regional identities, and celebration of leisure and culinary delights make it a captivating and vibrant way of life. While exploring, you can also see the Cerro del Socorro. You can visit this area by car, by going along this forest track. But on foot, you can get there in just about 20 minutes. This area is also marked with stone milestones until you see this beautiful sculpture of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. From this point also, you can see the entire city. Because my legs are too tired to climb to this mirador, or this lookout point, let's head up the stairs and see where this will bring us. As we walk up the stairs here, we are headed toward the Torre de Mangana. This is a historic tower located in the city center. It is known for its distinctive architectural design, characterized by this lovely square base, a robust stone construction, and a tapering structure that culminates in a circular viewing platform, or belvedere, at the top. The tower has a rich history, dating back to the medieval period. It served various functions over the centuries, including as a watchtower, part of the city's defensive system, and as a symbol of civic authority. The name Mangana is believed to have Arabic origins, as with many place names in the region. It's a term that may have referenced signaling or communication tower in the past. The Torre de Mangana's location was strategically chosen to provide panoramic views of the surrounding landscape, including the old town of Cuenca and the nearby river. The tower has undergone restoration efforts to preserve its historical integrity. While the interior may not always be open for viewing, we can appreciate this external architecture and its role as a symbol of Cuenca's cultural heritage. It is considered one of Cuenca's most iconic symbols, representing the city's medieval past and its role as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. The exact dates of the tower's constructions are not well documented, but it is believed to have been built during the medieval period, likely in the 14th century. It was constructed as a part of the city's defensive system, and at that point served as a watchtower. The Torre de Mangana is a testament to Cuenca's history and architectural heritage. It offers both historical significance and aesthetic beauty to the city's landscape. Now, Spain is so hot. Some places get over 120 degrees Fahrenheit, or around 45 to 50 degrees Celsius in the summers, and 300 to 320 days of sunshine per year. It is really hot in Spain. Doesn't it make you want to just rip your clothes off and sit under a fan? Well, you're not the only one. Nudity! in Spain, like many other parts of the world, has a complex history and cultural significance here, especially in the legal context. But nudity in Spain dates back to ancient times. The influence of the Roman Empire introduced a culture of communal baths and public nudity. With the spread of Christianity, however, nudity came to be associated with a sin and was discouraged. During the Inquisition and the subsequent conservatism of the Franco era, public nudity was heavily censored and frowned upon. Yet, Spain's climate with its sunny beaches has always encouraged a relaxed attitude toward clothing, especially in the coastal regions. Now, mind you, you're not going to walk around and see people going to the supermarket nude. Although, actually, there was one guy in Barcelona who did that and almost got arrested four times, but he wasn't acting in an inappropriate manner. He just simply only wanted to wear shoes and a fanny pack. Why the fanny pack? Well, he needed some place to put his wallet. <laughs> From these viewpoints, you can see some really beautiful sights of the city, but also some really lovely natural views. The Jucar River, which is known as Rio Jucar in Spanish, this is a vital and picturesque waterway. It meanders through the heart of Cuenca, and it contributes to both the natural beauty and the historical significance of the region. 
Originating from the mountains of the Sistema Ibérico in Teruel, Aragon, the Júcar River embarks on a scenic journey through the Valencian community before eventually flowing into the Mediterranean Sea. Cuenca's unique setting is intricately linked to this river's path, as it winds its way through the deep and dramatic Huécar Gorge, framed by rugged limestone cliffs that create a breathtaking contrast with its turquoise waters. Look at that! That's amazing! This striking landscape serves as a magnet for nature enthusiasts, for tour guides like me, <laughs> for photographers, and it offers a serene escape from the city's historical center. In the past, the Hukar River has been a lifeline for Cuenca, sustaining the city's development and way of life. It provided essential water for irrigation, powered mills along its banks, and influenced the layout and architecture of the city itself. Several historic bridges gracefully span this river, including the iconic Puente de San Pablo, a picturesque suspension bridge, and the Puente de San Anton, each offering a unique vantage point to admire the river's tranquil flow and the surrounding natural splendor. The riverbanks of the Jucar provide ample opportunities for outdoor activities, from leisurely hikes to idyllic picnics, all set against the backdrop of this remarkable natural environment. It is not uncommon to encounter diverse flora and fauna in this habitat as well, adding to the river's significance. Throughout history, the Hukar River and its gorge have inspired artists and writers contributing to the cultural tapestry of this region. In every sense, the Hukar River is an integral part of Cuenca's identity enhancing its charm, offering recreational respite, and enriching the city's cultural and environmental heritage. For lunch, I had a delicious three-course meal. It was for, I believe, 13 euros, and it started off with this tomato-based soup with egg and Iberian ham and crusty bread. It was very salty, also a little bit watery, but delicious. For the main course, I had these, uh, they called it the Cuenca Secret, which basically ended up being a very tender, pork cut and it was served with the most buttery mashed potatoes and tomato type salsa sauce oh it was delicious for dessert they had a tiramisu type cake it didn't have as much cream or as much coffee as i was hoping it was a little too sugary but i feel like it was a homemade version and therefore i could very much appreciate the effort that went into making this delicious thing. You might see some pets as we walk around today, so let me give you some fun facts about pet ownership in Spain. It has a long and intertwined history with the culture and lifestyle of the Spanish people. Pets, that is. Historically, dogs were often used for working purposes, such as herding livestock or guarding property. However, over time, pets, particularly cute little cats and dogs, have become cherished companions and integral members of Spanish households. This shift reflects the broader global trends of urbanization and changing attitudes about animals. Now, in Spain, you can't ask a tenant if they have a cat. Why? Because a cat is considered to be a part of the family. In other words, it'd be like asking how many children they have. It's irrelevant for the price of the apartment, and they can't charge more. 
However, landlords can ask about dogs, and that is what is mainly being asked when landlords inquire if you have a, quote, pet or not. They are actually asking if you have a dog. Fish, lizards, gerbils, birds are all a gray area. However, back to the subject. Pet ownership holds significant importance in Spanish society. They provide companionship, emotional support, a source of joy, of course, and they contribute to the overall well-being of pet owners. They also act the act of caring for pets promotes responsibility and empathy, particularly among children. Now, this is true everywhere. But in Spain particularly, over 40% of Spanish households have at least one pet. Dogs are the most common pet, followed by cats, and then with a growing interest in adopting smaller animals like rabbits or guinea pigs or hamsters. There's also a significant stray animal initiative here. They have just recently outlawed buying cats and dogs in the way that you might go to the pet shop to buy a lizard. You must only now get them from animal shelters or private breeders, but I would highly recommend to only shop at shelters or adopt, don't shop, as they say. This next part is of the hanging houses, the casas colgadas of Cuenca. In the past, houses of this kind were frequent along the eastern border of the ancient city, and today there are only a few of them left over. But of all of the structures, the most well-known is this group of three with wooden balconies. Now we're standing right next to the houses, so it's a little bit difficult to see, but the balconies we are talking about, the reason we say that they are hanging, is because the wooden balconies on the left part of the house here drop straight down. There's no landing below them. For example, if your laundry accidentally flies off as it's drying here, because that's what happens in Spain, we have no dryers, right? Uh, there will be no way to get it except for going straight down into the gorge. <laughs> um, although we don't know quite when they were built, there is proof of their existence in the 15th century, but these houses have refer been refurbished uh, as late as the 1920s. So a little more details for you. These are captivating architectural marbles that seem to defy gravity as they dangle precariously from the cliffs overlooking the Huecar Gorge. Dating back to various periods, again as early as the 15th century, these houses seamlessly blend Gothic, Renaissance, and Baroque architectural styles. Over the centuries, their purpose evolved from residential dwellings to a combination of homes and commercial spaces. But today, some houses are even restaurants and shops. They're perched along these cliff sides though, so they serve as this enduring testament to the city's rich history and unique character. One of the hanging houses, known as the Casa de los Corachan, houses the Museum of Spanish Abstract Art, or the Museo de Arte Abstracto Español, featuring a remarkable collection of abstract art from Spanish artists. These remarkable structures have not only stood the test of time, but have also undergone careful preservation and restoration efforts to ensure their continued existence. And in 1996, they were rightfully recognized as a UNESCO World Heritage Site, cementing their place as a cultural and historical treasure of Cuenca and Spain itself. Don't you find all of these beautiful things inspiring? Well, you're not the only one. Spain has a rich and diverse artistic heritage, with many famous artists who have made significant contributions to various art forms. Some of the most renowned artists in Spain are Pablo Picasso, who was one of the most influential artists of the 20th century, known for pioneering the Cubist movement and creating iconic works like Guernica. He was born in Malaga and spent most of his career in France, but remained deeply connected to his Spanish roots. Salvador Dali, who was a prominent surrealist artist known for his eccentric and imaginative works, born in Catalonia, and his paintings such as The Persistence of Memory are celebrated for their dreamlike quality. And Juan Miró, who is another prominent Catalan artist. 
he was known for his abstract and surrealist paintings. His works often feature playful, biomorphic shapes and vibrant colors. Who's your favorite? Let me know in the comments below. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you for your donations, for your tips, for your PayPal's. And as always, thank you for being a part of my traveling family. I look forward to seeing you soon. Bye everyone. Don't forget to follow and like this video for more with me, Explore with Kelsey. For more of my tours, please see my profile on Buy Me A Coffee. And under the shop, you will see all of my future live tours, recaps, live concerts, and recorded versions of all past events as well available for purchase. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel, which is Explore With Kelsey. Thank you all for joining me. See you soon.